In this chapter, we want to compare the influence of different influences of different parameters um, inside the dynamics of fluids. And we do this with a very specific kind of application in mind, which is making miniature or enlarged versions of fluid flows. So let me show you why this is important and what we want to do. Um, the principle is this. We're engineers and we want to investigate flows that are difficult to reproduce. Uh, so, for example, you could be working for an airplane manufacturer and you have an airplane which is 100 meters long and you want to improve the airplane. So you have six different ideas for how to improve the plane um, and you want to try those out. Uh, how do you do this without building six times uh, an airplane that is just gigantic? Uh, or you're interested in seeing how a mosquito flies. There are lots of mosquitoes in this room. Uh, and you want to study how the fluid flows around the wings of a mosquito. And you would certainly large, have to have an enlarged version of uh, a model of a mosquito at hand to study this. Um, or you're interested in uh, the fluid flow of liquid metal inside the furnace. And so any instrument you put into the furnace just melts away with the heat. Um, how do you investigate this? Making a model, making... Um, a model in which you're going to have fluids that are much more friendly to your instruments than, than liquid metal. Or you want to study fluid flow in a beating heart. And so it turns out not too many people are happy for you to just open their heart and stick instruments into it just to study the fluid flow in there. So you want to make models of, of that. Um, and once you make all of those models, um, then the question is, how do you adapt the flow parameters? Uh, for example, your airplane model uh, that you built is much cheaper than a real size airplane. This airplane model is 20 times smaller or 100 times smaller than the large airplane. Um, so what do you do with the velocity? Do you make it 100 times smaller too? Or, or should that be 100 times larger? This is the question we try to answer. So what we want to do is this. We want to have flows that are dynamically similar which means they are in exact miniature or in large version one of the other. And the flows are dynamically similar when the flow parameters are the same. So what we're trying to define here is what those flow parameters, what this kind of mystifying term means and, and how to make those the same. Okay, let's take a look. What we want to do is this. We want to write an equation that is very well known and very useful, which is the non-dimensional version of the Navier-Stokes equation. So what we're going to do for this is, is we're going to start with the Navier-Stokes equation. Navier-Stokes equation says mass times acceleration, which is this part here. This is the change in time of the velocity field, and this is the acceleration field. Um, this here, mass times acceleration, is due to gravity, pressure, and shear. And we want to rewrite this equation in a non-dimensional way. And so for this, we're going to create non-dimensional terms. And we start with um, time, which we're going to rewrite as t star. So instead of t, we want t star. And we're going to define this as a combination of factors on the right. I'm going to explain those. I'm going to do the same thing for velocity, for pressure, for gravity, and for the mathematics of, of vector operations, the non-dimensional del operator. So a non-dimensional term is, is basically a way of saying every time you have a vector, uh, which is an arrow, uh, it has three, has three dimensions, you split this into two components. And one is the length of that vector, and the other is the geometry, the direction in which it's pointing. And when every time write this uh, vector with a star, meaning it's a unit vector that points in the same direction as, as the original vector, but uh, has only length one. And the length itself will be embedded inside this scalar term over here. So we replace the vector by a scalar multiplied by a unit vector. Okay, and we do this for many physical dimensions. And what we do is time, um, with time first, is we take time, we say, this time multiplied by the frequency at which the flow repeats itself. So we're going to run time, uh, non-dimensional time, from 0 to 1. Every time we're going to study a flow, instead of studying it for 30 seconds, we study it for from 0 to 1. 1 corresponds to 30 seconds, and 0 corresponds to 0. Um, and so this happens in, within the period 1 over f, or with the frequency uh, f over here. Yeah? So a very high frequency flow is highly unsteady, changes all the time while a low frequency flow, we have a very long repeating period or an infinitely long period and is then quasi-steady. This non-dimensional velocity field is the same thing. We take a velocity field here and we divide it by the length of the velocity field everywhere. Yeah? So we get this 
a sea of little vectors, this entire field of little vectors, which are all length one, and are pointing in the direction where the fluid flow is going every time. Um, so V star is a unit vector field. And we do the same thing for pressure. Pressure, we take pressure as being, we subtract from pressure a P infinity, a, a reference value, if you want. Uh, and we divide this pressure by a reference standard pressure over here. And we get P star. And this P star, if you choose your reference values, P0 and P infinity wisely, this P star goes from 0 to 1. So you have all the pressures inside your field are normalized uh, down from 0 to 1. Um, then we have non-dimensional gravity, which is again gravity divided by the norm of gravity. And then we have non-dimensional math, which we need to manipulate those unit vector fields. And this is going to be non-dimensional del, which is some reference length multiplied by the del operator over here. And you put those now uh, into uh, the normal term. So you, you force those into the normal term. You, you, have, you have those, you have those things. So we're going to replace every time time by non-dimensional time divided by frequency. We're going to replace velocity by the length of velocity multiplied by the vectors, and so on and so forth. So we replace normal, fully physical terms with non-dimensional versions of those. And we put this now into the navier stokes equation. And this is very tedious to go through, and I'll let you go through if you want, uh, looking at the notes, but I'm going to skip through all the algebra through the math. So we'll just pretend we can read this very fast. Um, you take the navier stokes equation here, and you insert those non-dimensional terms over there, and of course, you get this, which becomes that, which becomes this, which becomes that again, and this again, and that again. And then you write this equation. This is now the principle here is important. We have an equation with terms, uh, whether there are scalars that have physical values, and those terms are in front of unit vectors. And this equation looks like this. This is it. This is the Navier Stokes equation. It is not more or less than the usual Navier-Stokes equation. It says exactly the same thing. There's not more or less information in there. It is just rewritten in a different way. And the way it is written is that we have every time in brackets the length of the vectors. And every time in green here, those terms in green, are all non-dimensional vectors, which are vectors that are pointing in the way that the vector would point, but they all have a length, one. Yeah. And it's kind of cool, because now you can rewrite again, this equation, and reorganize those terms here um, until you have terms here that all have um, no dimension, no dimension at all. And so you land on this equation here, which I just wrote previously, this equation there. And in those, we like to give those blue terms here. We like to give those names. And so we define, by convention, for historical reasons, uh, the Struhl number as being the frequency times the length divided by velocity. Then the Euler number as a difference in pressures divided by rho v squared. Then the fruit number as become as velocity divided by the square root of uh, gravity and the reference length. And the Reynolds number as being rho times v times l divided by mu. And then once you insert those into the Navier-Stokes equation, you get this. This says the super cool, glorious, non-dimensional, incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. This is Navier-Stokes equation, but written in a way that those vectors here that are all little star vectors, they all have length one. And in front of those vectors, you have numbers, scalar fields for numbers, which are the values, the lengths of every time, the, the local vector. And those lengths here have been given names. You have the Struhl number here. You have one over the square of the fruit number. We could have defined it, we could have given a name to 1 over the fruit squared, but for historical reasons, it just happens to be like so. Um, you have minus the Euler number here, and you have 1 over the Reynolds number there. Uh, and all of those are compared to this reference value, which is 1 here, which is sometimes implicitly written, it's not even written. And so you can see now that the magnitude of the pressure uh, term here this Euler term. This is compared to the magnitude of the acceleration field, yeah? the magnitude of the convective of the velocity. Um, and so you can see that those terms here give you the relative weight of different terms inside the Navier-Stokes equation compared to how much the flow is accelerating uh, in the local, uh, the locally. Here. This is super cool. Uh, it's super cool for two reasons. The first reason is that we quantify the relative weight of the terms. 
And this is not because we are physicists or we're very curious about this, but typically because we want to neglect those. We want to remove some of the terms. And so finding out which ones we can neglect is easy now because all we have to do is, is quantify quantify those one, two, three, and four numbers here, compare them to one, yes. And so if one over the Reynolds number is, is very close to zero, uh, then we can just dump this term here uh, from the equation, yes. Yeah, if the oil number is very close to zero, then we can just dump the pressure term from, from our equations. And this saves us a lot of time uh, when we compute flows, uh, especially with computers. Um, and the second reason why this is great is that we can know now how to obtain dynamic similarity between two scales. And this is what we started uh, this presentation with. Dynamic similarity between two scales means if you have a miniature version of a full-scale flow, you want to have the same unit vectors oscillating and vibrating uh, than in the original flow. Then you need to put the same numbers here. Yes. If you want to have the same non-dimensional velocity field, then you need to create in your miniature version of the, of the flow. You need to create the same Stroll number, the same Euler number, the same Fruit number, and the same Reynolds number, which it turns out in practice is very difficult, but at least from the physical point of view, we know what we need to do in order to create miniature or enlarged versions of certain flows. So this uh, is called uh, the super cool, super duper Navier-Stokes equation, non-dimensional Navier-Stokes equation, or short for to do it on your arm, uh, non-dimensional incompressible Navier-Stokes equation. Yeah, it's cool enough actually to to do it on your arm and, and to study. And in fact, it, um, typically in fluid mechanics, you may call this even uh, the Sphinx, uh, because Sphinx is the acronym of of the of the equation. It turns out uh, if you look at uh, what it's called, you could say it's some pretty important equation. No exaggeration. So it's definitely worth your time uh, studying and understanding the meaning of this equation.